Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Delaney Piggins. I'm the executive director of Ring of Keys. I use she, they pronouns. Uh, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the Open Writing Studio with uh, Kit Yan and Melissa Lee, uh, moderated by SC Lucier. I'm gonna give, yeah, hey guys. I'm gonna give them an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves, of course. Um, but first, while people are getting settled, while the live stream is getting going, I want to just uh, share a few thank yous. Um, thank you to HowlRound for live streaming this session. We're really excited to be able to share the work of Ring of Keys with uh, not only our members, but um, people who will benefit from hearing about collaboration and writing um, and hearing about the many talents that exist across our network. I also want to thank um, the National Captioning Institute for providing our live captions this evening. Um, those will be saved with this HowlRound live stream um, in the archive. Additionally, um, I want to thank all of you for joining. Ring of Keys is a nonprofit. We're an artist service organization that supports queer women, trans and non-binary artists in musical theater. Um, and we do that across the spectrums of, uh, of identity, but also of artistry. And so it's really important to have uh, people of um, varying mediums come and uh, enjoy a live stream like this or be a part of an open studio when it comes to writers. Um, so the folks that we're gonna be talking to this evening uh, are, I'll start with an introduction to our moderator, S.C. Lucier, also known as Lucy, is a director, lyricist, and book writer living in Brooklyn. Uh, they are half of the uh, the team, Lucy and Rose, um, and they are uh, creating intensely queer musical theater, specifically uh, Xena, the Warrior Musical, The Last Scroll, Three Dollar Bill, uh, a workshop album, which is out now, um, and another upcoming piece, Atalanta, The Long Shot. We also have with us tonight, um, Kit Yan and Melissa Lee. Kit Yan is a 2023 Helen Merrill Award recipient, 2022 Harold Adamson Lyric Award winner, 2021 Jonathan Larson Grant and Claiborne Prize recipient for uh, libretto, and 2021 Sundance IDP Fellow and Grantee, and a 2019 uh, Vives uh, Award recipient. Musicals include Interstate, Misstep, uh, Cancelled, Mayday, um, and Kit has worked across theaters, is supported by Playwrights Horizons, MCC, OSF, Keen Company, and many others. Melissa Lee, who is the other half of this writing partnership this evening, um, I'm going to go ahead and list them all again as a recipient of the 2022 Harold Adamson Lyric Award, um, 2021 Claiborne Prize, 2007 Jonathan Larson Award, and Lincoln Center Theater Writer in Residence. Um, musicals include Interstate, Misstep, Again, Cancelled, Mayday, and Surviving the Nyon. Uh, her works have received support from Fifth Avenue Theater, The Village Theater, Playwrights Horizons, Weston Playhouse, and Company One, among others. Um, as you might be able to tell by those bios, uh, Kit and Melissa are collaborators. You heard some similar awards and similar titles. Um, and that is why we're gathered here tonight, is to hear a little bit more um, and get a first hand look at the collaboration, the techniques and the process that you use. So without further ado, just a couple housekeeping notes. We're gonna treat this kind of like a webinar. So if you are in the Zoom with us, um, please uh, mute your mic and uh, also your video. We're kind of like flies on the wall for this process this evening, but you are absolutely welcome to put a question in the chat at any time. Um, we will be uh, working with those throughout the evening um, and we'll also you know, save some time to, to focus on each of those questions. All right, I'm gonna pass it off to Lucy. Thank you, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just here as kind of a facilitator, a moderator, a voice for you all who are, who are attending and your questions in the chat. And um, I'm essentially gonna hand it right off to Melissa and Kit. So I did it, there we go. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Lucy. Lucy. 
Um, yeah, just wanted to say a quick thank you to Delaney and Ring of Keys for inviting us here. We're um, always thrilled to chat and um, and to, I guess, give back to the community as much as possible um, with uh, the knowledge that we've gained along the way. So we're just excited to be here. We um, are grateful and we're just going to have uh, more of a I mean, it is more of a webinar format, but I think we are going to be a little bit more sort of conversational about it. And again, feel free to throw in some questions, which we may answer throughout the presentation or definitely at the end, we'll have a Q&A section. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. And Lucy, let me know if you could see the deck when you get a chance. Yep. Okay, excellent, great. So, um, so yeah, so what we're going to do today is... Uh, just talk through a little bit about our collaboration history, um, and then we're going to talk about our writing process, which is very specific, tailored to us. And then we're going to do a short open studio session um, where we will literally just do some writing um, in front of everyone. Um, as and, and we haven't prepared this beforehand, so you're seeing us at work the, the way that we normally would. Um, and then we're going to do the Q&A. And hopefully this will help folks um, that are joining us, folks who are thinking of collaborating or folks who have a collaborator and are currently just figuring out best ways to collaborate, um, or they already know how to collaborate and they just want to add new tools to their existing processes. Um, and one more thing I mentioned before, but I'll say again, is that like our process is like super unique to us. Um, Kit and I have been collaborating for over 16 years at this point. So we really just like fine tune the process for what works for us. Um, and if it doesn't work for you, feel free to take what you need, tailor it to your own pro process. Um, but this is what we found works for us and we're just hoping it'll be helpful. So um, let me go to the next slide. And Kit, do you wanna give us a little, uh, preview of like sort of like our backgrounds and like how we yep. met and started working together. Happy to do it. Uh, I believe we met sometime in 2004 uh, when I was going to college in the Boston area and Melissa um, was also going to college in the Boston area, but it was from Boston. And uh, we met at an Asian Sisters in Action event where we were both performing and uh, uh, then we sort of saw each other around the Boston arts community. Um, and at some point around 2006, 2007, we started performing every month at this queer Asian cabaret in downtown Boston. And that's when we became friends and we started to um, say, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we went on tour? Wouldn't it be fun if we put like our work, our, we made some art together? And that kind of started uh, in motion uh, our collaboration. Melissa was a singer songwriter back then, and I was a, a spoken word slam poet. And we just kind of started to uh, put those two things together. Yeah, and um, and then so, yeah, so we put it together and we went on the road where our band was called Good Asian Drivers. <laughs> um, and folks who know our work or maybe have seen Interstate know that that was the genesis for that particular musical. So. Um, so we'll just keep this part brief, but basically we went on the road, we wrote a lot of songs together, a lot of drama happened, and uh, and eventually um, what ended up happening was we, uh, because of what happened on the road, we started writing Interstate, and at the time, I think Kit, you were touring full-time as a, a slam poet, and I, I was working in tech, and um, and we just didn't know what we were doing. We just had a conversation today with a friend about, about um, this history where we just as like, we have this important thing that we wanted to say and create. We don't know anything about the industry. So let's just write and see what happens. And that's essentially what happened. Um, we wrote Interstate and then we became involved. Kit, I want to give you uh, kudos. Kit is the kind of person who is very methodical about like learning stuff. So he's like, I, I want to get to know the theater community. So you went to conferences, you like connected to the community, you like, uh, networked and you really learned about it. And that was when basically we started doing readings and workshops. So from there, we uh, up did the MTF residency, the Musical Theater Factory residency. We got into NIMF. Uh, we did Good Speed, uh, Johnny Mercer, uh, call, uh, Johnny Mercer, what is it called, Kit? 
it's just they named they renamed it so I oh they renamed it <laughs> John, johnny mercer something something uh, McDowell we went to McDowell and then eventually um Interstate went to NAMT and eventually went on to some productions all in all it took us eight years before the project saw its first production and sometimes we joke about it we're like oh like if we had known it was going to take eight years like would we have gone down this path we we don't know we'll never know but it took a long time um and so uh Kit you want to talk a little bit about like misstep and how we ended up you know where we are today <laughs> yeah, that's from from interstate. We sort of got into the theater and um, got to know the theater. We did a bunch of um, Melissa said lots of showcases, festivals, residencies. We um, were fortunate enough to um, have some grants and awards, and then we started writing our second musical, Misstep. It's an '80s dance aerobics musical uh, featuring um, a uh, lots of trans and non-binary characters and cast and. Uh, it just sort of came out of another passion uh, for me at the time, which was aerobics. <laughs> I used to, I was going to all these aerobics classes with all these uh, senior citizens. And I got really into it and uh, and then got, got Melissa into watching it, not doing it. And then we decided to write, um, I said to Melissa, I was like, this is our next musical. And, yeah, uh, and I, she, I was like, absolutely not. We're not doing that. <laughs> but then you started watching it. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. And we and then we started uh then we started writing writing this um this fun uh musical comedy. Um we have a bunch of other projects as well, but um I should also mention that Misstep uh will will be um most hopefully opening that show in New York City next year in the fall. Um and then we also have a bunch of other musicals that were commissions and um other things that we yeah, had some fun in different worlds and we'll we'll cover some of those later on today yeah yeah and so so basically our history at that point we um we started becoming part of the theater community we've been working on some more things and then eventually you know very gratefully getting fellowships and awards until we transitioned to being full-time writers in 2019 so um our collaboration now um we this is kind of a funny term but we are monogamous <laughs> in the sense that in the sense that when we were first writing we did do some separate projects um i, I know kit you were you did a residency at civilians um and i also had was working on a musical with some other folks and that was fun but i think eventually Kit and I, we just work really well together uh i think it's after 16 years of working together we just knew each other we find that we work better as a team and we're stronger and more streamlined and you know not everyone has to do this but it really works for us and so that's kind of where we're at now and for us uh again like I said knowing each other really well is important I think like collaboration is really intimate um, especially in a musical like it really should be somebody that you like or and can be honest with and I think for us it's all about trust support and respect and um, so so we in terms of being honest with each other we know each other's strengths and weaknesses we are not posturing with each other we just know I'm like I'm not good at this uh, but I'm pretty good at this and Kit's like I'm not good at this I'm good at this so so we're just really honest with each other about that um, we also talk a lot about um, the kind of stories that we want to tell. So we are aligned in terms of like, oh, like these, these are the things that we're attracted to. Um, these are, you know, like we, like, for example, like we're queer. So it's very important for us to have like queer storylines or queer characters. Um, we're sort of aligned politically there. And so the kinds of stories we want to tell typically are aligned as well. Um, we've also over 16 years have fought a lot so we all know how to resolve disagreements i mean once in a blue moon now we'll get really heated up over something and then we really just nip it in the bud right away we're like what is your problem right now like let's let's talk this out what's what's your problem with me right now and uh and it resolves really well so so i think that's really important in our collaboration um the next thing is in terms of finding our voice so we both know each other's voice and please chime in here kid also I know I'm talking a lot but like we both have our own voice uh, as individuals. Uh, we know who we are, but we also know our voice as a team, which is different than our individual voices like together we're we have a very specific voice so 
having f finding that throughout the years, I think is uh, is really important for us. Um, so now we know that together as a group, we write subversive dramedies with emotional center and queer characters. That's basically what we do as Kit Yan and Melissa Lee. Um, so working remotely, that's right. We are 99% remote. So obviously sometimes if we're doing a workshop, we have to see each other, but most of the time we see each other just like this. And so working 99% remote um, means that we have to have a lot of tools to help us. So not just Zoom, we also work in Trello, we work in Google Docs, we have like Asana to assign tasks. We, you know, we work on final draft collaboration. So we have a lot of tools to help us. And um, the process that we've developed that we'll share today really enables us to work really smoothly remotely. And uh, Kit, do you have anything to add so far? I was just gonna say, we, we worked remotely before the pandemic, even when we lived in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And we also find that working remotely is important for us to stay in this partnership too, because we have different life goals. Like I live in Montreal, uh, Kit lives in New York, and sometimes Kit, you go home to Hawaii, right? So so it's like also being respectful of what we need as people, as human beings, and like things that fulfill us in our life, because, you know, as much as we love writing, like it, it's not our entire lives. So so having that and being really honest about what we need is, is important. Um, and yes, both Lucy and Kit chime in if you if there's anything you want to add. Um, yes, and then I've mentioned it a little bit before, but in terms of our goals, we're we're aligned. So we have really deep and long discussions every year um, to do some annual review and be like, what are our goals this year? What have we done last year? I think sometimes it's a nice exercise for collaborators to do that to be like. First, take stock of what you did, because sometimes, especially in our industry, and get you do this a lot, where you're like, oh, especially in this industry, it's it's hard to feel like you're succeeding. I think like musical theater is so hard, and so it's good to just take stock. Like I, I always go, Kit, here are the things we did last year. We actually did kind of a lot, or like, oh, we got this fellowship. Like we should be proud of that. So, I think taking stock is really important, and also saying, okay, well, this year, what are some things we we want to do? What are some things we want to do this year? Um, what are some hopes and dreams? And sometimes it's a reach, but sometimes it's it's just good to have that written out. Um, so yeah, so we have Monday meetings every Monday. We do uh, weekly, bi-weekly creative sessions where we just sit down and like talk about anything that we want to. And we send like weekly digests to our team. Um, and so yeah, anything to add on goal setting kit? I'd say like because we have so many years of our annual goals, we can actually like go back and see if we've met any of them, which is particularly helpful for me because I'm definitely a person that's always like, we haven't accomplished anything. <laughs> and Melissa is like, well, here's the receipts. Yes, yes, here's the receipts. A hundred percent. That's amazing. I have a question or two. Yeah. If that's okay. So I, I'm also, I'm coming from a place where, you know, I've been in like an eight year monogamous creative partnership. So I'm totally on your same page. I agree that it can be a very intense, incredibly intimate process because you're sharing, you know, your creative self with another person and collaborating. Um, I, and I love nipping things in the bud. Megan and I have like an IOU dinner system where we sometimes get up to like 15 or 16 dinners of what we owe each other. Uh, but anyway, uh, my question is some folks here might not be in a creative partnership that looks similarly to yours or or mine. And uh, do you have any advice about how to start that process? Like if you could look back at your relationship at the beginning, what were some things that really helped you come into the intimacy of that collaborative partnership? Or what is what's some what is what's a piece of advice that you would give to folks who are just starting out writing with someone else? Um, and and figuring out that that's kind of can be a scary process, but it's really rewarding. Do you have any thoughts about that or advice? Yeah, I'm going to toss that to Kit because I've been talking a lot. All right, cool. So let's see. Um, like Melissa said earlier, writing with somebody else, writing a musical particularly is a pretty long-term relationship. Like Melissa and I know that if we start a new musical, we're going to be in relationship with each other and all the people that are also going to work on that show with us for the next 10 years, basically. And so it is really important to us to 
commit to that journey and then also not just with each other but in choosing our collaborators and people that we're going to be like going on this decade-long journey with it'll it's important that we're all aligned in the same goals and that um generally we like hanging out with each other um i i really uh we spend so much time uh eating and going out and the hot time in between rehearsal and opening a show and um, developing work and all of that, that, that it's really important to just um, work with people you really like and trust and that you can, you can spend time with outside of work as well, because there is a lot of downtime in between, in between things. Um, I don't think it's that bad of an idea to treat it like dating, asking a lot of questions, asking a lot of like questions about process, style, commitment, um, goals, life goals, like what is happening in a person's life, like getting to know them, just sort of being friends, friends first in terms of like getting to know a, a person. Um, Cause there are so many times when like knowing what's going on behind the scenes in someone's life really gives you such a deep understanding or some like generosity or patience around different things that, that I find all of that to be really important stuff. Um, and I guess if I were to go back and and sort of think about things again in terms of like people I've collaborated with, um, obviously not Melissa, but like other things I've done, I'd say like, I mean, even, in, even in our relationship, Melissa, we've, um, we've certainly taken a lot of breaks and, um, and not worked with each other and worked with stuff, worked on stuff with other people, but I'd, I, I, if I could go back in time, I'd say to myself, like, it's okay to put a time limit on this, on a partnership too, and say like, All right, let's try it out. Let's just let's go a year and let's see like what our draft looks like and see if we liked doing that. And then, um, and then maybe think about like continuing on. Cause again, like at some point in the process, once you've really sunk your teeth in, it's like a little bit hard to get out of it. Yeah, like, yeah, and just to add to Kit, like, exactly, I think there's no shame in, like, trying something and then not moving forward with that person, you know, trying with them. I, I, I was going to say exactly the same thing, Kit, about how, as weird as it sounds, it really is, like, the way that you would approach a romantic relationship. I mean, it is a relationship, and so so you have to treat it as such, and like Kit says, the, goal, the goals have to be aligned um, in order for it to work out long term, so... Um, so yeah, so having those conversations early, I think is important. Is that, is that yeah. the answer? Okay, great. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And good luck to everyone who is out there searching, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's difficult to question. find and it's amazing to find. So thanks yeah. for answering. Um, okay. And I guess the last thing that I didn't realize there was one more thing on this slide is that the, the developing processes, which we are going to jump into now. So um, our writing process, like I said, is very uh, unique, but is helpful for us. So hopefully it can be helpful for you. First of all, I think it's really important to point out that we are writers that are really story forward. Um, and Kit, I'm actually going to let you talk a little bit more about what that means and, and how that's different from some other folks. Yeah, happy to do it. And just to give some clarity to um, our process too, Melissa and I are writers for theater, TV, and film. And so we use the same writing process across all mediums that we work in. Uh, and so what we start with first, regardless of the medium we're working with, working in is story. Uh, we'll, we'll do a ton of ideation. Uh, we'll get into the specifics of that a, a little bit later, but a lot of a lot of just throwing ideas against the wall. Uh, I keep a very long list of ideas and things I find interesting that uh, I really bother Melissa with all the time in terms of like presenting ideas that could become something. Um, I've learned now at this point, not every idea I have can be a show. <laughs> and so- M Most? <laughs> Uh, yes, 99% of things I think about will never go into anything, and that is fine. <laughs> but um, yeah, we start with a lot yeah. of just like uh, ideation and then brainstorming. Yeah. We'll, we'll go into brainstorming um, uh, in terms of like what something could be. 
Uh, we're going to go into detail on all this. I'm just yeah. going to fly through it a little bit. Yeah, uh, we'll, we go into outlining next, which is just like the bones. We'll, we'll outline the bones of a story, a beginning, middle, and end, etc. And then we go to draft, where we, we do the first draft. Um, it's usually very messy. We solicit a lot of feedback, and then and then we're in rewrites. Yep. Um, so yeah, thanks for zooming through that. Um, so just real quick, let's talk about ideation. Like Kit said, um, we do we do ideation. We throw things against the wall. I've outlined sort of two buckets of what we in terms of our work, what we generally have in terms of ideation. One is organic. It's like kit's been mulling over something for like years and it's just like i really want to write a story about x right so that's more organic i also have that there was like a uh, i think there was a tv show that i wanted to write for like 10 years that was in my mind that we only recently started to write um so that's really organic the generative ideation is a tactic that we came up with when we started doing this essentially full-time as a job where somebody is like, well, we need a, we need a pitch on X, Y, and Z, or um, we got a commission for something. What do you want to, what do you want to write? Um, so we had to come up with a good way to uh, generate these ideas quickly and stuff that we really care about. So, um, so yeah, so as mentioned, organic ideation is stuff like interstate, that's like kind of about our lives or misstep when Kit went to <laughs> step aerobics and then, and we just had that idea for misstep. Um, generative is more, we did a show called Adventure File for Keen Company, which is a short piece um, and May Day, which was something that we did during the pandemic, which was also a commission. Um, so like Kit said, we created an idea bank where we just throw everything in. Um, and from there, we have a free flowing discussion on what we want to explore. So maybe it might be helpful for some of you to also have an idea bank. And what we typically put inside an idea bank is, well, A, we read, watch, listen, and experience and like live life. I think that's like a really important piece that sometimes people forget um, in that in order to have any ideas, you have to just like experience being a human. So I think that's one. And then the second thing is just jotting things down. We have a spreadsheet that I'll show you a little bit of um, where we jot down all our ideas. And inside the spreadsheet, we also have links and resources um, because sometimes that's helpful in terms of reminding us like, oh, what we liked about that particular idea. Um, and it could be like three words or it could be like more fleshed out. It doesn't really matter to us as long as we get it down on the page. Um, and then we often have to, we often can refer to these ideas if we need inspiration. So just to give you a little snippet, this is mostly kits. I just want to say it's very get, like dolphin in love with a woman is amazing. Uh, we haven't written that yet, but kid. Uh, but these are basically just, we would just jot it down and, uh, and, and sometimes we'll just pick from it. I feel like at some point we'll probably <laughs> expand some of these. <laughs> Yeah, I do also want to jump in. The reason why sometimes we have to um, be uh, really fast and like on the fly with our, our our ideation phase is because sometimes the turnaround is really quick. Like, um, for example, I think like last week we got an open writing assignment, um, which which just means it's like a brief from a studio. And like this week we're having the meeting. And so sometimes the timeline is like so tight that like it's really like, we just have to churn it, churn everything out. And because we work remotely and we don't live in the same place, it's just helpful to do everything so that we can both see it in real time. We can both work on it. Like everything can, can get turned around really quickly. Mm, that's great. Um, so uh, Lucy, before I move on, do you have anything on this section that you have questions? Okay. No, I was excited for brainstorming. Let's okay. go. Okay. Let's go brainstorming. So brainstorming is where we bust out our, what we call our prep sheet. So this is something that we've design, designed and it's not, we, I mean, we didn't create it. Like we just grabbed it from like other pieces of information, but we put it all together. And I think what's helpful for us is literally everything is together on this sheet. Um, and I think Delaney, I think we shared it with Ring of Keys, which will go out also for folks who want to use it. It's much longer. It's about two or three pages, but it has um, the main things that we, the main bones of what we need to create like a full story. So that includes like the setup in terms of questions, themes, what form it should be, um, the world, motifs, mood board and characters. So it, that's the setup of it. Then we have a log line, which we'll talk 
a little bit about um, what that is in terms of helping you just create like a, a story with, with a hook. Um, and then we follow this emotional journey to again, break up the bones. Um, and let me see. The reason why we have our prep sheet is so A, we can organize our thoughts, but B, the second one is pretty important. We just learned this recently is that sometimes we we fall into a trap of not agreeing on the story that we're writing. Like, I think that we're telling this kind of story, but Kit thinks we're telling this kind of story. And so the prep sheet actually really helps us literally get on the same page about the story that we are writing. Um, so, so that's important. And then it helps us build out the story piece by piece. Sometimes it feels overwhelming to be like, now we have a commission, we have to write a whole ass story. But it's like, actually, let's just focus maybe on characters today. Let's focus on like what world let's, and then we are able to build out the everything piece by piece. Um, from here, we can tailor it to our needs. Sometimes we don't fill out certain things completely because we don't need it. So feel free to also do that. Um, we do it on Google docs. It's easy to collaborate. It's very flexible. And we jump around, like I said, as needed. And it's a great place to throw in resources, links, random ideas, notes, dramaturgical notes. So it's it gets really messy, but uh, but everything's pretty much there. Kit, I saw you unmute. Do you have? Do you want to add something? No. Oh, okay, great. So that's our prep sheet. So log line. So we're just gonna quickly blow through this. I'm looking at the time, and I know we we have more to cover. So the log line is that it's basically a brief one to two sentences that's like summarizing the story premise. And so for us, what's important in it is that it should just have main characters. Like we know who and we know what, and we know challenges that they may face and maybe have some sort of emotional hook. So some examples is here in Misstep, an unremarkable trans woman assembles a ragtag group of trans friends to compete in a regional competition in order to fulfill her late father's dream. But in order to win, she must defeat her middle school arch nemesis. So there's character, there's what she wants, and something is in her way. Uh, same thing, adventure file. Three Asian American hosts of a popular travel podcast are trapped in a mysterious remote island where, haunted by the ghosts of dead children, they are forced to confront their own colonial behaviors. So that was something we wrote. And then get do this one because this was like uh, your idea. I just want to add Adventure Files available. So I think you can get it through Concord. Oh, if, Adventure uh, <laughs> If for some reason you no. Is, no, no canceled no, is not. available through Concord. Canceled is available. But you but you could hear this, I think, on Ad Keen. Adventure file is available on, on Keen's website. Oh, or Spotify uh, or just, something. Just for free. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Lucky. Um, when his father's gambling addiction puts a family restaurant at risk, a trans porn star struggling with body dysmorphia is thrust into an arranged marriage with a woman from China and must keep his true self hidden from his wife in order to protect his family. Yeah. So this yeah. one's for a pilot. Yeah. Um, so in terms of log line, how to come up with one. Uh, let's talk through this. Kit, can you talk through this with us? What we do? I am a huge believer in free writing and journaling. I just love it so much for myself, um, mostly because I actually have a very bad memory. And so if I don't write it down, I'm really just going to forget it. And so a lot of times, like Melissa and I will get on Zoom just like this. We'll set a 10 minute timer and we will just um, write on the topic. So if, uh, I'll choose the last thing, like if we were going to write, if we were coming up with ideas around building the world around um, pornography and a transgender porn star. We would just for 10 minutes write and write and write about it until the timer is exhausted. And then Melissa and I will just like read, share those thoughts with each other. Um, from that, we'll distill and we'll come up with some log lines. So then we'll set the timer again and we will just write many, many log lines. We're not precious about it. We just come up with a whole bunch of them until our brains run out of steam. And after that, we'll usually vote on like which ones resonate, which ones are really hitting, which ones like fulfill. Sometimes um, it's which ones fulfill the brief. And then after that, we will just give each other notes or ourselves notes really on the on the log line. And then we'll come to, we'll try to come to an agreement on it which is really helpful. And um, we often through the writing process, we'll go back and, and tweak the log line as well if, if things change. But oftentimes it's really 
helpful for us to have just a one or two sentence description of what we're doing so that as we write, we can go back to it all the time and just say, this is what we set out to do. Are we actually doing it? Yeah. So uh, do you have anything, Lucy, from this section? I'd love to ask a question from the chat. Actually, Christy is saying that um, uh, I'm loving this level of organization, but notice that not everyone takes this joy, such a joy in this level of, of planning. So the question is, are you both organizers and is that key to your compatibility or does one of you drive the organized systems? And I would add, is that ever a point of contention or what's a way to make that really work if you're not level at the same level with organization? That's such a great question. Um, what do you think, Kit? I think we're both organized, but in a very different way. And yes, it does come to a point of contention sometimes. Often. Right, um, usually I have a vision for the organization and I want to be organized, but I don't know how to execute you can't it. execute it. And so I'm aspirationally organized and Melissa is actually organized in practice. <laughs> that's That's true. But sometimes I will say, Maybe this is this is helpful. So if, I, if if not everyone finds joy in organization, um, sometimes I don't agree with Kit. Right? Sometimes I'm like, oh, do we need to go through this process when I already know like the story that I want to tell? Right? Sometimes I want to just skip and and do something do something different. Um, but I think I think what I've learned, and we've tried that too, and we've tried that. But I think over time, what I've learned is like, oh. It, it's just hard because then if we don't follow this process, at least for us, um, it it ends up getting really messy. And like I said before, we don't end up knowing what story we're really telling if we don't like jot it down and do this. Um, yeah, I'd also say that when we were first um, starting to get our creative process organized, we just use other people's sheets. This is like now the sheet that we use that is sort of a combination of all the things we like and things that help us. But we just used other people's sheets. Our sheet is available for you to use as well. So if you don't want to come up with your own thing, just use ours. And then like, and then like cut out all the stuff you don't want to use, which is yeah. essentially what we did throughout all the years of, of figuring out what works for us. Yeah. And like I said before, I think it's totally fine that it doesn't work this way, right? I'm looking at this slide here about the log line and the free writing. Like it's totally possible that in your collaboration one person just comes up with the idea and the other person is just game right so that could be your process where it's like i, I don't want to do all of this free writing and seven minute timer and blah, blah blah like we just have an agreement where like i have the best idea so i'm just going to come up with the ideas and then you you know like you're or, you know, you're going to chime in in this way and you're just going to go along with it so that's also fine it just really depends yeah, I'd add that it would depend on if one person had a very strong vision. So if somebody has a strong vision, they're like, oh, I want to do this, and that's easy to follow. But if it's like an idea that's like, I don't know what this is, like, I just have a character, and I don't have the right. story, or I have the world, like in misstep, and I don't have the story, then going through this exercise can help fill in all the gaps. Yeah. I imagine that it's also important to get you both on the same page. I feel like that way as well as even the process, even if you, you know, it, it is important sometimes to go through those steps um, because I imagine how, how often do you think that your log lines change or how often should you check in about that North star of what the piece is? Do you feel like you just, you can just feel it and you call a meeting and you're like, let's just redefine what this is or how does that process work? Yeah, that process, when it does change, it doesn't change a lot, like Kit says, but sometimes it does. It doesn't change in terms of like 180, like this was now aerobics, but now it's like something totally different. Like yeah. it doesn't change Gosh. like that. But as we're going through the exercise of, let's say we're we're talking deeply about themes and we decided, oh, like the theme of this should not be about um, about a woman coming out of her shell, but it should really be about like her generational trauma. Like when we get there and we're like, yes, this is, this is better than we would go back and tweak the log line. And actually log lines are, we tweak them quite often also depending on what we need them for. So even after the whole thing is written, like if we need to submit it to something or if we are uh, just trying, sometimes we try different things out depending on uh, what angle we wanna tweak it. So yeah, thanks. Okay. okay, so moving onwards, we're just gonna quickly talk about like the setup section of this um, and how we approach those. So in terms of the setup, the first one is questions. So Kit is, Kit, you love this section. I almost never write anything in this section. 
Yes, this is my time to shine where I get to ask, <laughs> like, shine. to be or not to be. And I would just, I, I'm, I'm a writer that really needs to understand what deep emotional question we're asking of every single thing that we write. And so I, this is just an opportunity to get all of that down. Any, any question at all, like, why am I writing this story? Um, is it important? Uh, does it, does it convey what I'm feeling about my relationship to my family? Like, um, what is my relationship to family? Uh, what is this play going to look like? Like, those are just like all, anything I have that is giving me anxiety is, I put it here. <laughs> <laughs> and then themes, Kit? <clears throat> And then after that, we sort of distill some of like the, our ideas into some themes. So like themes, maybe a theme would be like queer family or chosen family, or a theme is like, um, like good versus evil, or like a, a rags to riches story, or um, like yeah. what, um, something just like the, the big, big picture yeah. idea of what's, what's happening here. Like what, what is love like, or, or love queer love or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, then we'll go ahead and we'll choose, um, we'll choose the form. So what, what vehicle is best to tell that story, whether that's a musical, a play, a feature length screenplay or an episodic screenplay. And then within episodic, of course, there's a lot of choices to be made as well um, in terms of like serial procedural anthology and limited. And so we, we put, we spend a lot, a lot of time figuring out the form because we have found in the past that uh, if we are unclear on form, it's, it really gets in the way of the writing process because uh, I, it, it has happened and it's okay to like write an entire play and then like realize it's a screenplay, but it is a lot of work <laughs> to go and do it over again. And we have done it many times. And so this, these days, we just try not to do that. We just try to go, okay, is there a big enough world? Are there big enough stakes? Are there deep enough themes and big enough questions that it warrants, say, like a feature length film? Um, if not, for example, we wrote a short musical called Mayday. Mayday is a 10 minute musical because we had a 10 minute story. And, and that story was like, um, it took place during the, the 10 minutes that um, I got a cell phone notification while I was in Hawaii that a bomb from North Korea was heading to the island and that we were all going to die in 10 minutes. And so everyone freaked out on my island and that the whole thing occurred in 10 minutes and the whole play occurs in 10 minutes. And so um, sometimes we we spend a lot of effort trying to figure that out because um, it's it's really important to nail down um, the the confines in which the story will be told in. You want to take motifs? Oh sure, yeah. Uh, world uh, in terms of the world, uh, yeah. Like Kit said, so for example, in May Day, we describe the world in which the story takes place. So where, when, what did it feel like to exist in that world? So for May Day, it was in Hawaii. It was in 2018, 19. I don't know. 2018. I don't remember. Um, and then what was it, what did it feel like? I think you went and you worked in some tarot garden um, in your last moments on earth, which, you know, didn't end up happening. Uh, so yeah, so really describing that. Um, motifs, if you have them sometimes, like maybe at an early stage, you'll be like, oh, I want this like show to be, uh, to have like recurring musical tags or like we want to tell the story backwards or like do flashbacks. So if you just have that yeah. as like, a catch thing that right at the beginning it's good to jot that down Narr narration voiceover yeah um like yeah. third person you know whatever whatever you're gonna do yeah and both kit and i are also really huge proponents of doing mood board again this is to help us nail down exactly the story we want to tell so other references that reminds us of the story and world we'll just throw them in like tv shows books whatever um so to have songs pop songs stars have colors record. yeah yeah um, so the next really big one is characters, and that takes 
uh, a lot of discussion, probably a lot of brainstorming on our end too, um, about who these characters are. We usually just take a, like a full day to talk, talk about the characters in this world once we have a log line. Um, and so we, uh, I have a friend who sent me something from NYU that she got that was like a character map. So we also have that at the bottom um, that has lots of questions about like your character's dreams, hopes, desires. And we don't always use that, but uh, it's good to have that there in case we're like, oh, do we, how do we, how can we flesh out this character more? We can always go back to those prompts. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Kit, but okay. Um, so uh, just a quick example here. We wrote a musical, a short musical about um, Boston's Chinatown. It was a um, commission. And so just like a quick glance, this is sort of how we, you know, how, how we jotted things down, literally just uh, it, there's, no, there's no, we just, just filled it in, you know, for Kit. How do we make progress as a community while remembering our past? Like these questions, like what are ways in which our history can live on? So this is just like a real snapshot of what that uh, what that show is and then the, the, the prep sheet. So yeah, it's about a grandma who's a hoarder who is the last holdout of her um, luxury of her building that's getting demolished to turn into a luxury uh, condo. And she's there on the coldest day of Boston, the coldest day of the year, and uh, she has lots of relics and um, and things in her home that have lots of stories to it. So it's a song cycle, and and that was what we worked on. So, okay, Kit, do you want to talk about the six feet emotional? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, quick? so in the past, we used to just use like um, templates we found on the internet, um, and that were a little bit longer in terms of just like form. Um, not so much to like tell us how to write a story, but just because like it's sometimes helpful to um, follow follow a template before going off and doing your own thing. I, I, I come from like a poetry world. And so it's sort of like using the form, using a poem to uh, a poem format and then and then writing writing my own poem afterwards. But these days we use um, a little bit of a shorter form so this is a bit more skeletal than those um the longer form templates we used to use we found that it's really helpful to go zoomed out just because um it allows us much more freedom to be a little dreamier and a little more like blue sky in terms of figuring out what a story is and where it's going and so we have found that if we just figure out these six things everything else can can fill itself in and we can elongate and adjust as needed. So it's important to us to figure out like the setup and what we mean by setup is introducing the world and the main character and any um, characters that are, are in this world. And then a point of attack or an inciting incident. So basically just something that happens that is going to change this character's world from what they are living in now to the, the, the adventure or the, the new world they're about to enter and whatever they're doing. Um, at some point they make a decision to go and do that. So we try to identify at which point do they make that decision. And uh, we try to identify a big play at getting that that want or that goal or getting the thing that they're, they set out to do, um, which usually is met with something, some adversity. And so that's the almost part. Um, so main character succeeds almost just means like what that's the point in which we are introducing what gets in the way. Um, after that, there, there are usually a lot of like funny games and adventure and like a, the, here's where you can add in all the fun things. This is where we typically add in like any winding journey they go on, new relation, like new um, like relationship adventures or, or things like that and things that really like start to build tension we're going to raise we usually identify what raises the stakes here um, because we've already identified what's in the way and so there are lots of other things that usually get in a person's way that include like external and environmental factors their their jobs their families um, where they live or or emotional ones like and those things create emotional squeezes which are like um, pressure and anxiety or frustration or anger or sadness. So we try to identify all those things in that moment, in, in that moment. 
Um, at some point, we do try to identify at which point the character, uh, the main character will break through and kind of figure figure out how to solve their problem or how to how, how they're emotionally moving through that problem. And then at the end, we're introducing here is the new world that they're living in, the new life that they're living um, and what that looks like. Uh, these days, we are often uh, leaving the door open for sequels. So we will build that in as well into this new life, this new lifetime. Um, and like Melissa has on the side here, um, some of these some of these options we're really not endorsing them. These are just from a Google search, and <laughs> and but save the cat we did used to use it was really helpful when we were first starting out to just use somebody's like 13, 13 point template. Um, though that one's for movies, and um, Dan Harmon's Story Circle is for TV. TV I think. Yeah, and I think there's there's even a 40 beat structure kit where it's like actually for a movie how every beat and how many there should be in movies. So um, just real quick, if it's helpful, uh, we're just gonna go through in terms of misstep, like our, our 80s show, like what all these mean. So like Pam is an unremarkable woman, self-proclaimed unremarkable woman living in New Jersey. Her estranged father dies. She returns home and learns he was an aerobics competitor. Then Main character committed, wanting to get close to the father she never knew, she decides to compete. She finds his former coach and assembles a ragtag group of trans friends to be on her team, the Snapping Clams. Main character succeeds almost. Despite learning that the reigning champ is Pam's middle school arch nemesis, the cl Clams train and improve. Pam learns a special move, the impossible, and she's ready to compete. Then, emotional squeeze, what Kit was talking about here. Um, the clams have a practice performance, but it is a disaster. Embarrassed and frustrated, the team breaks up. After learning that her father had sacrificed his dream to support Pam when she was younger, Pam is determined to compete again. And then at the competition arena, the team gets back together and triumphantly pulls off the impossible. Pam makes up with her arch nemesis. And then the new life. Pam's friends celebrate their coach's new aerobic studio, named in the clams' honor. So... Uh, pretty straightforward, and then we obviously fill in the blanks with everything else. Um, and if, uh, if that sounds fun to you, you, you can watch it next year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we also use a tool called Trello. So again, we don't want to overwhelm anyone who <laughs> don't prefer to, you know, don't prefer to have so many processes in there. But for those who this might be helpful, um, it's been really good for us remotely to use something called Trello. So here you could just make cards. So you could write like as long or as short as you want. It's sort of like post-it notes. And then you can move them around to act one, act two, act three. You can shift things around. You could throw things away. You could archive them. You could label them different things. So this has been really, really helpful for us and, and our process. And, um, and we've used it in this outlining process as well. Um we do work in Trello, but I am a huge fan of the final draft storyboard. And I will often, to your chagrin, do my my beat boards in final draft. And then we usually end up going back to Trello because in Trello, you can move the cards around in real time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great example of like, do what works for you. I think like there are still, still after 16 years, there are moments where Kit and I just butt heads on like how we like to work. And I think and at the end of the day, we're just like, okay, you go do the thing that you need to do to do your best work. And then like, if we need to, even though it's double the work, I will transfer that onto Trello for my own sake. And sometimes we do that. Um, so real quick here, outlining, then that's the next phase, outlining. Um, it is more detailed than the six beat structure. Like we said, it really is a scene by scene for us, uh, scene by scene breakdown that happens. It's, this is so that we have the framework so that we can go to draft and we know exactly what we've discussed before. This is where we identify where songs go. I know that we took a whole 46 minutes before we started talking about music in a musical. This is how it works for us. I know some other folks who just start with writing a song, but for us, again, we are story forward. So we need to know whether or not that song serves the story. Like we need to know if it's in the right place, who's singing it, why they're singing it before we could write it. Um, so this is where we identify where the songs go. I personally found it helpful to use placeholder titles, even if even if those words never make it into it, because it sort of helps me at least 
think in terms of starting, okay, like what, what is this about? So just c c come up with something. I think uh, when we wrote Interstate, there's a song called Man Up where uh, the main character, you know, has to confront his toxic masculinity and he's like getting in a fight in, in a bar. So that was the first word that came to me. So I was like, oh, the title should be Man Up. And it eventually did end up being Man Up. Um, so yeah, uh, it should flow easily and read like a story. And so this is sort of how it looks like once the outline um, has been written. So it has the scene, where it is, what happens, and then the song titles. Uh, yep. And then next we go to draft. So we have tried a lot of things. <laughs> uh, we have tried these three options. One, we have both tried simultaneously working on final draft collaboration mode. We do not recommend it. It is janky no, as hell. I don't, don't know, do Lucy, if you've ever tried this, Lucy. It's but too it's, buggy. It's buggy. And also we found that it just took, so, we're just such different writers, both Kit and I, that like, it's like I write something and then Kit would be like, no, I don't want her to say that. So then we like have to argue about every line. I, like This is just this is too much. Let's like not do that. So simultaneously we've done. We've also split the show by uh, acts. That, uh, oh, yeah. I just want to say what Bachelor X is. Bachelor X was a um, a commission from Playwrights Horizons, and so that was the first time that we were we were trying to um, we had an short. idea. Yeah, it was short, and we had an idea of what we were going to write, and then we were trying to do it in in final draft collaboration collaboration mode so that we could do it in real time and move through it quicker. But the opposite ended up happening. Yeah, it was much slower. I was like, I don't want you to stare at me while I'm trying to write. Nope, so I my own space and then I'll move it into a place that we can both be in. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. So so the second thing that we did here for misstep was we actually split the show by acts or scenes. So we would be like, oh, you take this scene, I take this scene. We've also done it by acts before. Um, and that works. It's just that we have to add in the extra time at the end to read it together and really clean up the voice and the tone and make sure that so that does take a little extra work on the end but that we've done that before but at this stage of our careers we basically do this we do it separately by draft and remember what i said at the very beginning that we know our strengths and weaknesses kit's strength is he is so generative he could just sit down and we joke that you're like poop it out like you just go like it just comes out is blurted out and i go up and i i scrub because my weakness is that I will just stare at a sentence for like five hours and be like, is this the right sentence? I don't really know. And then it just never gets written. So <laughs> Kit, you are the blurter and I I will scrub afterwards. And we found that that works really well. The real time editing is really all of our worst like moment, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the biggest hurdle. So no real time editing. You know what? Doesn't happen to Kit. <laughs> Kit doesn't doesn't happen to Kit. Kit's like this is this is great. This is great as is, and and I think that's actually really important in our partnership. To somebody who's just like I am not precious about any single word here. It just yes. needs to get on the page. Uh, I'll, sometimes it will. Like I, I think that if I was in the same place continuously, I could do the entire feature length thing in three to five days, and it usually doesn't turn out that great. And then I <laughs> hand it over to Melissa and she really makes it sing. And you know what? Sometimes I do rewrite a lot of the scenes, like straight up, like from scratch. I would just be like, Kit, I know you spent five minutes on this scene, but <laughs> I'm crumpling it up and I am tossing it and I'm scared. But, but for me, I found that even just having that on the page is like good enough for me to like be like, oh, I know, like I have an idea here. Right? I want to change this entirely. So that's um, true. Um, you rewrite me a lot. Like yeah. you, you, I, I would sometimes like 90% of what I wrote, you just throw away. Yes. And um, yes. And then uh, this is also a stage in terms of for because this is in terms of musicals, Kit is really good here on the first draft of adding in placeholder lyrics. So even lyrics that aren't going to make it in, it's helpful for me. Again, I suffer from blank page syndrome. So um, so even just having those lyrics in, even if they don't rhyme, even if they make no, no sense, like doesn't matter, just having them is helpful for me when I'm doing the songwriting. Um, and in terms of songwriting, I know a lot of collaborators that sit there and write the songs together. For us, it just doesn't work. Um, I need my privacy. So Kit will do the lyrics and then I will go off, write the song, and then I'll bring it back to Kit for all of his thoughts and notes. And then we will tweak it together once there's something there. 
So that's how we do that. Just like in scenes, sometimes like you don't keep a single word from my lyrics. Yes, sometimes it's not a single word makes it to the end. <laughs> uh, so this is the last slide we have before we jump to the open studio. So I'll just go through this real quick. Um, Actually, I think, Melissa, I wonder if it doesn't seem like we have a ton of time for the open studio because we did end up taking a lot of time to go through pretty like in great detail, like the process. I wonder if we do just spend some time on it. Oh, okay. It, well, it I think just we doesn't... should do it a little, no? Well, how are we doing on time? Because we're going to end in about 30 minutes, right? I want to save some Q&A time. What are you thinking, Lucy? Are there a lot of questions? Uh, not too many. I think it might be helpful if you want to spend five minutes just getting to the open studio section, and then we can maybe maybe take two minutes on this on this section, and we can get to 20 minutes of, of open studio. Does that sound good? I think that sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah, if there's not a whole lot of questions right now, then I think that's that's also fine because, you know, this is a shorter Q&A. Um, great. So in terms of rewriting, um, we are also really process oriented when it comes to this stage as well. We will solicit feedback and we will gather all our notes. Um, we do workshops as well for our musical theater, for theater. Um, and for that, we do, we're really thoughtful in terms of like, what kinds of feedback we want depending on what stage we're in like as we all know not every piece of feedback is helpful a lot of times the feedback is like people in the audience want to write your show for you that's not helpful so we're really specific in terms of what we're asking the audience to give feedback on so we'll get that written and verbal we'll gather it all together we talk to few people we trust we have dramaturgs we have uh, i will say before yeah. we move on from that part melissa that mm -hmm. it is there have been times we've done an entire workshop and we have just said like we're not looking for feedback Yes, yes, sometimes we don't look for it at all. Um, yes, correct. So we also talk to dramaturgs, peers, like other trusted writers that we respect their work. We uh, talk to producers. If we're doing a show with a theater, obviously we wanna hear what the producers have to say. Um, a producer can mean like a studio or like a producing partner as well who have yeah. very many notes. Many, many, many notes, exactly. <laughs> and um, our agents and our team, of course. Um, and then, again, this is a relationship between the two of us. This is our baby at the end of the day. So we have to decide what we want to change. And it's not always the same same stuff. So sometimes we feel like, yeah, like we're just going to discard that note. We don't want to go that direction. Sometimes we're like, oh, that was a really great note. We should make that change. So again, we use Trello. Um, I think I did convert you, Kit, to this, to, to making changes on Trello, because it's easy to see like all the things we need to do. Um, so we make a list of changes and then we assign them. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I have a vision for the scene that we need to change. I'm going to take it. I'm just going to go ahead and take it because I have a strong vision for it. Or sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, I'm distracted with something else. Kit, can you do all the changes? And then I'll look over it after you do it. So sometimes kind of it's cool. also uh, parsed out due to capacity because um, these days we kind of have a lot of scripts flying back and forth um, in different mediums. And so it might be like somebody's working on this movie while somebody's working on like a polish of this other script at the same time. And it's just like whoever finished first can go on to the next thing. Yeah. So is there anything, Lucy, before we dive into the next section that needs to be addressed now? Um, I don't think so. I just have to say, I just want to underscore your, your note just then about performing and maybe not soliciting feedback. I just want to encourage everyone. You never know what you are going to unlock for yourself when you see something, when you see your piece on its feet, when you see it perform. Don't be precious in that moment. Be brave and you will discover things and you do not need to solicit feedback from folks if that's something that's holding you back. I just felt like underlining that because that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, it took us many years to uh, figure out you can just to learn that lesson you know, thanks. Not, yeah. <laughs> not do anything afterwards except celebrate <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and sometimes you need that sometimes you need to just celebrate you don't need to know what's wrong with your piece from all these <laughs> random people so yeah absolutely um okay great so um the open studio i think was sort of kit's idea so we'll do a little bit of it before um we pause uh for and questions. uh feel free to jam with us at home on your own paper yeah, that's true um, and Kit, I think you came up with this idea because you were saying that sometimes people talk a lot about what they do, but we don't see a lot in real time, like how they do it. And you were saying that it, you found it helpful for you. Yeah. I thought it could be helpful for me, but I don't know. 
We're about to find out. <laughs> We're about to find out if it's helpful for you guys. But but I mean, I personally think that sometimes seeing someone do it, like, you, you know, we, we never get to be in the room. We just hear about what they do. So we just thought we would try this experiment where we get to invite you all into the room where we do things. We Like I said, we didn't practice this beforehand. We did take one of our existing log lines from like our idea board um, and use that for what we're going to be jamming on today. But um, yeah, but we don't know what's going to happen. So we'll, we'll see. Okay, so this is, the, this is the log line prompt that we had. Um, it is, uh, it, so it's after spotting an ad from a European city and sorry, from a European city looking to pay young people to move there because their residents are dying off. A group of down and out American queers move there and clash with the local elderly population. Um, so that was an idea that I had because we we saw, I think, an article where if there's random town in Italy or paying people to like live there because their residents are dying off. And I was like, Kit, why don't we and our queer friends all move there um, and take over that that town? So um, so, yeah, anyways, I'm going to share um, I'm going to share our prep sheet that we're going to work in right now instead of this slide. And here we Go, Lucy, can you see? Can everyone see? Yep, I can see. I'm going off video, but I'll chime in if I have any clarifying questions. Okay, amazing. Okay, Kit, how do you want to start this? Oh, okay. questions. You're already typing questions. I know, I had to stop myself. Classic, classic. Uh, you don't have to stop yourself. We can go there. We can start there. Okay, we'll just set a timer and we'll just like fill it out. Uh, yeah, we could set a timer or we could talk through it. Um, it doesn't matter. I was thinking okay. maybe we talk through it. Maybe we talk through oh, it. Oh, okay. Does that mean you're typing? I'll type with you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, questions. I like why why would a person want to move from one place to another? <laughs> like what are the migratory patterns of humans on Earth? Um, what is migration and what does that mean to a person? Uh I feel like you have a lot of migration. Uh, intrigue who gets to migrate and why okay what is italy like is it fun to live there oh my god um Damn, is it fun to live there i was thinking like what sort of i i don't know where it goes but i feel like i'm interested in maybe it's themes sorry i'm just kind of like also free jamming here Maybe it's in themes, but I think like I'm interested when I think of this log line in like what in like how they change each other, how each group changes each other over the course of of the musical. Uh -huh. so, like, like chosen family and queer family yeah. world. Yep. Or even even like the elderly population maybe are like conservative or have some sort of preconceived notion about all these like queer queerdos like moving in and but then they grow as a result of their friendship and maybe the other way around yeah perfect perfect what does an intergeneral community yeah <laughs> or, or both good question <laughs> um yeah, so in terms of themes, I'm going to throw in another theme of like late stage capitalism <laughs> is bad for our health. What do you mean by that? And why does why is that relevant to this? Because I think that the queers, well, the queers are struggling, right? They're like down and out American queers that are struggling in the US and they're like, wow, like we should not be here anymore. So I feel like that's a theme that I'm really interested in. Love that. Um. Especially for right like so they have to find another place to go um yeah i love your migration questions maybe that's also a theme yeah yeah i love that that's really great this is why i don't type i just i just don't know, know. how to do it we'll just say it and then i'll type it like <laughs> Okay. Just okay. Um, I guess for the purposes of this, I mean, we. I think originally when we came up with this idea, we were thinking maybe a show, but like I feel like 
it could also be a musical, which is why we grabbed this one, right? Well, I mean, what, what's the what's the world here? It's like, no, I I couldn't see it. I absolutely could not see this as a full length anything until we until I saw some of this stuff that we just worked on here. Like, yeah, like because uh, I am thinking like, is the story is the world big enough or like? But to me, themes of like migration and like people moving from one place to another and intergenerational family and what happens when like I don't know this has some themes of Im imperialism like I can imagine that these like even though the queers might be um uh, disadvantaged in America they are going to move to Italy where that gets challenged because maybe their privilege is more than they thought and they are becoming what what role in like imposing their own culture or standards would they have on these uh, senior citizens in this place or stuff like I could totally see that being a pretty big big world and big fun story I really couldn't see this at log line only at lo you're right right but now we can see it that's right um yeah so what do you think we should put in the form I guess we would say it could be a musical yeah I guess it could be a musical it's a comedy a musical comedy yeah could it be a musical film I don't know let's just jot it down for now and then does it feel episodic for any reason do you want to go on like a 10 hour journey on this maybe if they're like really exciting like characters depends on the characters and if the setup could last okay can't see it yet but you know Shit's Creek was really uh long lasting so that's true that's actually really that's a great comp it's a good comp yeah for this yeah that's a great comp uh let's talk about the world I, I just put European city because I left it open for us to do a different European city but the original inspiration was somewhere in Italy so I like Italy vibes you know, I went to Venice in the fall and there was a huge like conversation in Venice around like um, tourism and it's hurt, harm or help to the local economy. Like it seemed like a lot of people um, really, it, it's kind of like what we have in Hawaii where like our economy is highly dependent on tourism, but tourism also erodes our ecosystem and our like resources and I found a very similar conversation happening in Venice um yeah so I mean, so maybe Italy is good is what you're saying yeah remote like town in Italy it's the world that I'm seeing you know like European vibes very chill very chill juxtapose with like the non-chillness of Americans. It also gives us a little bit of stuff, uh, something to work with too, if there's like a pre-existing story, if we can like build off of some real world events. Yeah, yeah, I, I wonder, I guess we didn't follow up on that particular thread but after I read that article. I don't know if like people ever took them up on it and if like yeah. new people had moved there, but that would be interesting to follow up on. I'm seeing this happen in Japan too. You know, in Japan, you can buy um you can buy a house for like twenty five dollars too. Because, um, what's happening in Japan is that like, um, the younger people they don't want to live in the um countryside anymore, so they're moving to the city, and then the how the homes are just being abandoned, and so you could just like go and get a house for twenty five bucks in Japan now. Oh wow! Yeah, I've also seen it in other places as well. Um, sorry, I'm just copy and pasting because. It's the same. We already have the log line, so I'm just dropping it in there. And um, I know we probably only have a few minutes left, but why don't we take a stab at characters real quick? I don't think we'll get to the emotional journey because that even when we're doing it um, for real, like it takes us days and days and days before we even get there. Um, but what are some ideas? I I think maybe we could base it on our friends. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, um, something like wanna, that. Sometimes we start that. Do yeah. you want to try to hone in on a main character? Sure. Okay. I okay, always it, had a okay, go ahead. Go ahead. You seem to have a vision. I, I had a little bit of a vision. I felt like I feel like for someone to want to pick up and leave, 
like I don't know I've always been interested in like someone who just went through a really bad breakup like someone Seda? who's just down in the dumps oh my god don't say her name oh sorry <laughs> I was so sorry I wasn't really supposed to, I was, oh uh S? no no us <laughs> Um, yes. So, so yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about like either me or you, like after a, a bad breakup or it could be Seda, I guess it could be like anyone who after going through a really bad breakup, it's kind of like down in the dumps. I feel like could be like a really fun main character that we root for in a musical comedy set in Italy. Yeah. What do well, you think? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go down. Let's see if that has any merit. Let's go. Okay. A, okay. somebody who's just gotten out of a breakup you know so what? let's just lean into it let's we're gonna lean into it oh her no name is now Sada. you wrote her name on the thing <laughs> uh. she doesn't care <laughs> she's a good friend of ours okay queer person just went through a breakup a catastrophic breakup <laughs> catastrophic um here's what went through a catastrophic like, character wise she's always kind of like looking for her next husband okay but this is a queer person so now we're gonna make her queer sorry say that oh that's cool yeah that's fine i mean sorry or not sorry yeah uh just <laughs> through catastrophic upgrade <laughs> always looking for her next wife okay so somebody who's like a serial serial dater is that fun is that fun or is someone more misanthropic? No, that's more fun more because fun. she's about to move somewhere where there's no prospects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I'm laughing out loud, that is funny. That's <laughs> pretty funny. That is funny. She's about to move somewhere where there's zero <laughs> prospects. So a serial, <laughs> serial dater. Um, okay, so we went through stuff. What are some other options that people would want to move? Good, we have to talk about other people like a best friend, you know. Uh, um, well, actually, I want to I want to do an alt for oh, this. Oh, do an alt. Um, I'm just trying to think of like the kind of character that would want to move from one place to another. So, what about say say is somebody looking for something? What about somebody running away from something? What kind of what kind of characters are running away from something? Uh, well, we could go financial because that is literally the whole premise. So, all right, Bank like bankruptcy, debt, bankruptcy, massive bankruptcy, debt, debt. Looking to run away from it all. Okay. Um, interesting. Can go classic crime. <laughs> now it's a crime. Now it's a crime story. Like say this committed a crime. And he's running away from it. Yep. Uh, I'm just gonna throw all the options on, and then we could choose what's good. But yeah, I just want to exhaust all the fun characters that could go on okay. this kind of journey. I don't like the crime one, um, but we'll keep throwing it on the wall. Okay, running away. Which is the genre? We could go back to romantic. It could be like runaway bride. Oh, okay. So we could we could be running away from something. Yeah. That they got uh, a little too too in too into too fast yep. too soon. Yep. Got into something too fast, too soon. I think that's great. Um. Okay. Any more? This is a couple of running away. What about some more, more running towards? Or either? You have any for either? Uh, no, I still like my idea the best. Okay. <laughs> I uh. feel like this is this is what how it normally happens. <laughs> We throw out the alts. I commend you on your alts. I would be like, oh, these are such great ideas. I still like my idea the best. <laughs> so true. So that's, that's how it happens. <laughs> but these could be other characters. I think they should be the other characters is what I'm saying, which is why I think your alts are actually really helpful because let's say, you know, and like if this were uh, uh, for real, I I do know. I just want to say to the folks listening, like eventually we will change the names. But at this point, I do think like using our friends' names are okay, and then we'll change them later because it helps us. So you know, uh, I don't know, like commit a crime. Let's give that to Olympia. You know, let's like put our, put our friends in there. You know. 
Where do we write? Okay, there you go. See, now we have a cast of characters that are all looking to do something. They're all friends and uh, they're headed out there. I didn't think about this, but that is a fun idea. If it's like um, more ensemble and everybody has their ish that they're yeah. running, running to or running from. I'm thinking a little bit like, like maybe misstep in a way where it's just like rooting for like a group of people that uh, just want to leave for whatever reason. And now we we want to see them and who they clash with. So What's funny about this scenario is like everybody's leaving for their own reason, but they're all quite codependent if they're going to do it together. Right. <laughs> they so, have to be codependent group of friends. So yeah, that seems like it's it's uh, important to this, this setup over the years there. Yes. <laughs> Basically their codependency awesome. yeah sorry yeah so anyways I, maybe this is a good place to pause um yeah okay to see but yeah so what we would do from here is we would just flesh them out we'll give us we, sometimes we give ourselves a lot of space to in between to just like germinate and you know the next time we come back to this document sometimes kit you've already filled out some things you know or i've already filled out some things um that we thought of that we will discuss and walk through so we often will spend way longer on something like this like in to fill longer. out just these sections on the sheet that you see in front of you um before going to outline we'll spend probably weeks and sometimes months on this and in the outline phase like i think the longest we spent is we spent an entire year right on our disney project yeah, we had a Disney project that we did, but part of that was also we needed to get feedback from them. Yeah, but yeah, like we spent about and a, stuff. a lot of notes, but that was about an entire year before we started writing. So for yeah, something that's so, for ourselves and our own, a little faster, I think, but still longer than this, for sure. Yeah, so we, we really try to um, spend a lot, a lot of time just nailing everything down. And of course, like things are really flexible because like once we go to draft, a lot of times some of these big pieces will change, like a character might not be working exactly in the way that we thought, or the um, the conflict or the adventure that they're going on may not, mm -hmm. may not be totally what we talked about, but uh, we spend so much time on this part because um, it, it, it really helps us just like write a really solid first draft that neither person is going to be surprised about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, Lucy, I'm going to toss it back to you. Wonderful. That was so, um, that was such a great insight into your process. Thank you so much for going through that. Um, I think at this point we have maybe just a minute. Uh, I don't see any, any, uh, guest questions, but I actually have a question that I'd love to just end on if that makes sense. And then we'll, we'll throw it back to, um, Delaney. So my question is, first of all, thank you again this is such an amazing uh insight but what makes creative collaboration so truly building something together as a team different in your mind than creative compromise and what attributes of co-creating do you find most important in that process this is very in the theme of what we're talking about here can you say that beginning part again what the, the difference between what and creative compromise yeah, so creative collaboration. This is I'm this is always something that I'm talking about and thinking about. That creative collaboration, which is, you know, building a building a tower together, is different than creative compromise, which often happens, I feel like, in our field where folks are siloed in their own uh their own skills, where you're building towers and you're connecting them together and pulling things out and and connecting. How are those are does this strike you as a concept of two things that are different? What does it really mean to be in creative collaboration? And what what attributes in that process are most important to you as a writing team? Yeah, that's great. That's such a great question. Let me jump in real quick and then I'll toss it to Kit. I think for me, it goes back to what I said at the beginning that we have our voice as a team. I think the the difference for me is that we have to see it us as as like as like one essentially this is not my project that i'm writing that kit's helping me on this is not kit's project it's actually a collaborative project right so i never think of it as like oh i'm compromising on my own voice i'm thinking of like we know what our voice is and the best story that we want to tell as a unit so i think that 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 helps me in terms of 
not fighting like, oh, this is how I would tell it if I were doing it on my own. Well, it, I'm not doing it on my own, you know, like I'm doing it with Kit because I value our voice. So um, so I, that's how I think about it. And Kit, I don't know if you have anything to add. In. Yeah, that's a really great way to put it. Um, a lot of times uh, one person is in a supportive mode. So when we're collaborating and compromising with each other, like it, it might be that like Melissa had a really, really strong vision for something. And I just know that like, I'm going to take a little bit of a backseat and I'm going to follow her lead because um, she seems to really know what she wants to do. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes like, and I'm really notorious for this, like I have an idea that I want to work on, but I don't know what it is. And then we are building something together from scratch in a really different way. But um, it still involves a lot of like both collaboration, both people adding really good and bad ideas into the pot and then still still some compromise too in terms of figuring out like okay um what what maybe like what format does this want to be in or what um who gets to you know who gets to do which part um we don't always we don't we don't run up upon those problems that much lately because we just kind of know like I love to write a first draft Melissa loves to do a polish like I like um and maybe she's in like song world for for something so I can just like go to outline on something else like it, we just end up really doing what we like um, organically yeah for sure that's wonderful um okay any last uh any parting words that you'd like to to share uh no we really enjoyed doing this this was really <laughs> illuminating for for me too for you <laughs> Yeah. What did you learn? What else? <laughs> Tell us. I mean, yes. it is nice. Sometimes it's just nice to, you know, talk about your process to other folks because that really does like eliminate and solidify things. And um, and thank you for sharing with us your working relationship. And I'm sure you inspired a lot of a lot of uh collaborators to to go off and and creatively collaborate. So thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Kit. Thanks, thank you too. Thank you, thank you so really, much, Lucy. A joy to be here. Yeah, and thanks to Rain Keys. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to Fellini. Thank you so much. I know it is such a creative and also a vulnerable thing to share a slice of your collaboration. And um, uh, I really hope that what you were writing comes to fruition because I would love to see those four friends in Italy very, very much. <laughs> um, and we'll of course be following all the work that you do from here on out. Thank you, Lucy, for so intuitively jumping into the right questions and, and guiding us through this process. Um, I just wanna share that if you are joining us either on the HowlRound live stream now or later, if you're in the Zoom and you are not a member of Ring of Keys, um, but it seems like the type of network that uh, would work for you, um, you can apply to be a key on our website. We have workshops. Uh, we have an open mic night uh, coming up tomorrow evening with out of the box theatrics at Theater 154. Um, and we have an upcoming meetup on Wednesday. Um, so it's a perfect time to be a key, uh, perfect time to get out there and start meeting uh, more queer collaborators in the musical theater community. Um, and we're so glad that you joined us for this this evening. I'm gonna put two links in the chat for you before we go. One of them is for uh, becoming a key, and the other one is for checking out the resources um, associated with this uh, session with Kit and Melissa that they uh, mentioned either in their session um, or you'll see that sheet that we worked through this evening um, also on the website. If you have any questions about anything that we do at Ring of Keys, um, I have an inbox as well. It's Delaney at ringofkeys.org and you're always welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'd be so happy to uh, welcome you into this community. Thanks so much again for everything tonight. Thank you to HowlRound and thank you to NCI. We hope you have a great evening.